So in terms of intersection of lines, if we have two lines L1 and L2, there are four possibilities. Either the lines intersect um, at one point. In this case, the lines are different. Uh, here, um, we are saying that the two lines L1 and L2 are distinct and they will intersect at one point. So in three dimensions, we have that. Uh, in three dimensions, we have uh, the xy plane here, and then we're saying that these two lines are going to intersect at only one point there. So we'll see how to handle this, uh, this, this case. And then possibility number two is that we have two lines, L1 and L2. And in this case, L1 and L2 coincide. So to show that L1 and L2 coincide, we're just saying that it's like they are overlapping. One is on top of the other. In this case, the two lines will intersect everywhere. So they will have an infinite number of points of intersection. This is going to be tricky in terms of the treatment here. There's always a one mistake that students tend to make in terms of the handling of this case. So we'll see exactly how you're supposed to approach it. And then in possibility number three, uh, we have the two lines, L1 and L2, being parallel to each other, but this time around, they do not intersect anywhere. So in possibility number three, we're saying that the two lines, L1 and L2, uh, here, they are parallel, but do not intersect at all. So they are parallel and distinct. So if they are parallel and distinct, what do we see? So it's similar to this, with only one minor difference, one minor change. You see, in number two there, the two lines are parallel, but they are the same. So because they coincide, we can argue to say that L1 and L2 here in number three are the same. But in number three, L1 and L2 are parallel, but they are different. In such a case, the two lines will not intersect at all. So it's like you have L1 on top, and then you have L2 down here. So they will have one or two things in common, but here the two lines will still be different. You will see exactly how this is going to go. So this is what happens if they are parallel and they're different. The two lines will be parallel but they will not intersect at all. So such lines, um, yeah, we'll, we'll keep these just like this. We'll see the treatment of, of, of these. And then we finally go to number four. In number four, what happens? For number four, we have the lines uh, L1 and L2. These two lines are distinct. So they are distinct but not parallel. So they're distinct, they're not parallel, and possibly one line is on top of the other. So you have one line on top of the other. How does this look like? So it's like you have something like this. So you have one line somewhere there, and then the second line can be drawn such that it is somewhere here. All in all, what you're trying to show here is that the two lines will not intersect at all. It's like one line is on top of the other. Uh, the way I've drawn them, maybe you might think that they will. Of course, this is in two dimensions, so it's very difficult for us to, to show exactly that one line is on top of the other. But here we're trying to show to say that there is some gap here. Even if we are to stretch them this way, these two lines will not intersect. This line will pass on top, but this one will still pass below uh, that red line L1. So in this case, where the two lines are different, they're distinct, and they are not parallel, and um, one possibly passes on top of the other, in such an event, or for this type of scenario, these two lines are called skew lines. So here, these are going to be, say, skew lines. So if two lines are described as skew lines, then you have to know that these two lines will not intersect at all. There is a high chance that one will pass on top of the other, but they will not intersect. 
So you have to get that. So they'll be different. These two lines are different, they're distinct. These two lines are not parallel. And possibly one of the lines passes on top of the other one. So this is the four, these are the four possibilities that are possible when it comes to discussing the intersection of lines. Now, let's do some examples. Consider this example here. In this example, we have two lines L1 and L2 as described. And the question here is, they want us to discuss the intersection of these lines. Well, to discuss the, the intersection, the easiest way you can approach it, first is to ask yourself, are the two lines parallel or not parallel? So to see if the two lines are parallel or not parallel, you're going to look at this section here. For this section, when you look at this problem, what we see is that here this is a 1, this is a 1. Here this is a 5, this is also a 5. This is a negative 1, this is a negative 1. What is this part here that we are comparing? This is a vector that is telling us the direction of each line. In For line 1, we are seeing that the vector kept telling us the direction is R. Let's say this is telling us the direction of that line. It's i plus 5j minus k. And for line 2, we're seeing that the vector giving us its direction as well, it's the same vector. It's 1, or basically just i plus 5j minus k. So we're seeing that the direction of these two lines, it's the same. Based on that, we can easily conclude that these two lines are actually parallel to each other. Now that's the first key thing you have to first uh, get out of the way. Are the two lines parallel or they are not parallel to each other? You see, if the two lines are parallel, then it means that in terms of their intersection, it can only be one of two things. Either the two lines intersect everywhere, meaning they coincide, or the two lines intersect only, or the two lines do not intersect at all, sorry. So either they intersect everywhere or the two lines do not intersect at all. So that is for parallel lines. Remember, that was case three, where they are parallel and do not intersect at all. And case two, where they are parallel and intersect everywhere. So once you see that the two lines are parallel, then all you want to do is, do they intersect everywhere? or they do not intersect at all. Now, how do you test it? You see, this is the simplest one to actually prove. You see, if they are parallel and they actually do intersect, it means that if one point, if you know one point belongs to line one, for them to coincide, it means that that point must also belong to line two. But if a line that belongs to line one does not belong to line two, it means that these two parallel lines do not intersect at all. How do you get in that? If they coincide, means that we have this version. When a point is identified to belong to line one, automatically it must also belong to line two. That is if they coincide. Regardless of what point you pick on line one, it must also belong to line one, line two if they coincide. This is for parallel lines, I'm specifying again. But if the lines are parallel, and you pick a point on line 1, you notice that it doesn't belong to line 2, regardless of the point you pick. As long as the two lines are parallel, if any point you pick on line 1 does not belong to line 2, it means that the two lines, even though they are parallel, they do not meet anywhere. Even if the point picked is from line 2, if it doesn't belong to line 1, it implies that the two lines will never meet. They don't meet at all. So here, we know to say that our lines are parallel. So now how do we check that a point belonging to one line uh, belongs or does not belong to the other as well? So remember how these lines are presented. To present a line, in this case, these lines are presented in vector form. Both lines are presented in vector form. And in vector form, this position is for a point belonging to the line. This point 
belongs to line 1. And this is a vector that is parallel to line 1. So we're going to use a point. So let's pick a point on line 1. So the point on line 1 that we're going to pick, the point P, will get the same point which is given to belong to line 1. 5, 11, and 2. If we wanted to pick a point on line 2, we would have picked this point. This point is said to be on line 2. So we would have gone with that one. That is still a method or an approach we can pick. So we know this point E is on line 1. Now the question is, does it also belong to line 2? If it belongs also to line 2, then we can conclude that line 1 and line 2, since they are parallel, then they must coincide. They must coincide or they intersect everywhere. But if just this point does not belong to line 2, then we'll conclude that line 1 and line 2 will never meet. They are distinct. So let's go to line 2. From line 2, what do we have? We're going to present line 2 in uh, using. Um, See, so we're going to present line 2 in terms of parametric expressions. So let's get the parametric expressions. We know how we get them. The x we equate to this plus u times 1. And then the y we equate to the minus 9 plus u times 5, just like that. So when we express line 2 in parametric form, x will be equal to so uh, what are we going to have there? So in this case, x will be equal to 1 plus u times 1. So it will be 1 plus u times 1 will just be u. Then y will be equal to, that's uh, negative 9 plus u times 5. So you have negative 9 plus u times 5, which is 5u. And finally, z will be equal to, that is going to be, 9 plus u times negative 1. So that is uh, 9 minus, that is u times negative 1. So that is just minus u. So this is what we have. Now, what follows here? Well, we did pick this point to belong to, to, line, to line 1. So to check if that point belongs to line 2 as well, you see this point is presented as x, y, uh, x, y, z. So we're going to get the first to be the value of x, this to be the value of y, this to be the value of z. And we're going to substitute them here. What we want to see is what will be the value of u that is going to be result for, uh, from, from this substitution. So from the first one, where there's x, I'll put the x coordinate of that point. So that is going to be 5 is equals to 1 plus u. And this will imply that when 1 goes to the left, it becomes negative. So it will be 5 minus 1, which is 4. We get u is equals to 4. How about on the second expression? On the second expression, where there's y, we're putting 11. So now we have 11 is equals to minus 9 plus 5u. When 11 goes to the left, it becomes positive, no, not 11, when 9 goes to the left, it becomes positive. So we're going to have 9 plus, uh, 11 plus 9, that is going to give us 20. So this will be equal to 20 is equals to 5u. When you divide both sides by 5, this will imply that u is equals to 4. Now, here's the thing. If this point indeed does belong to line 2 as well, when we substitute for x here, the value of u we get must be the same as the value of u we obtain when we substitute for y here, which is what we're seeing here. When we substitute for x, we got u is equals to 4. When we substitute for y, we got u is equals to 4. But that's not all. It must be true also when we substitute for z. So when we substitute z here, what will be the value of u we get? Even if the first two are the same, u is equals to 4, u is equals to 4. If the third one gives us u is equals to 3, then the point does not belong on line 2. For it to belong on line 2, 
even from the expression for z, the parametric for z, the value of u must be the same as the first two we've obtained. Let's get it here. For z, we have a 2 there, so we'll put a 2 here is equals to 9 minus u. And here, when this goes to the left, we end up with 2 minus uh, 9 is equals to minus u. Here, we end up with minus 7 is equals to minus u. What we end up with? u is equals to 7. So, does the point P that we got from line 1 belong on line 2? It doesn't. Just because of this conclusion here. For it to belong to line 2 as well, the value of u, if it was 4 there, here it must have been 4, which it was, but it must have been 4 here as well. But currently it's not 4 there, it is 7. Based on that, the point P does not belong on line 2. And because just that one point, which is assured to be on line 1, is obviously not on line 2, it implies that that point is not shared by the two lines. And remember, for parallel lines, either they share all the points, like here, either they share all the points, then they coincide, or they don't share any point at all, not even one point will be shared. So in this case, since we have seen that the one point we have from line one is not shared at all, then we can conclude that these two lines, even though they are parallel, these two lines are distinct or they don't intersect at all. So our conclusion is, therefore, L1 and L2 are parallel, So they are parallel and distinct, just like that. Okay, so this time around we have uh, these three examples. We're just going to sample through and see um, what we can do from here. The question is the same as before. Discuss the intersection of the following pair of lines. So we can pick the first one. Seems very straightforward. We have two lines. L1 presented in a uh, symmetric form. We have x minus 2 over 3 equal to y minus 5 over 2, then z minus 1 over minus 1. Then we have line 2 here x minus 4 over minus 4, y minus 5. Of 4 z plus 2 over 1. Okay. So these are the two lines that we're given, and we want to see if uh, want to discuss the intersection of these two lines. The first thing that you want to do is you want to understand if the two lines are parallel or they are not parallel. So to check if the two lines are parallel or not parallel, you want to check their direction vectors. So how do you get the direction vectors from here? From the first one, remember, I think when we were introducing this concept, we saw to say that the direction vectors, the coefficients will come from what is down here. And when you look at what is down here, okay, so here, what we are saying is that the direction vectors here, we're saying if the direction vector is given by, let's say, uh, R1, we're saying that for this one, it's 3i uh, plus 2j, then minus k. This is the direction vector for, li for line one. For line two, the direction vector, let me call it R2, here it is minus 4i, then we have plus 4j, then we have plus k. So what we see here is that these two direction vectors are different. Based on that, we can argue to say that these two lines 
are not parallel to each other. So I hope you have you have got that part. Now, since the two lines are not parallel to each other, how do you proceed? You see, when they are parallel, it's easy. They either intersect everywhere or they do not intersect at all. That is why you only pick one point. But because they are not parallel, you cannot just pick one point here. You have to be very careful here. They intersect at only one point. If they intersect, it will only be at one point. Based on that, that point might not be the point highlighted in line one. It might not even be the point highlighted in line two. It might be a different point altogether. So it will be premature of you to just pick a point from here and say, hey, this point belongs to line one. If they intersect, it must belong to line two as well, just like we did in the previous example. That would be wrong. Here, how do you proceed? Here, you have to keep it general. From line one, express each line. Line one, express it in parametric form. So from here, to express it in parametric form, I'll use parameter t for line one. So I'll say from line one, I have t is equals to x minus two over three. Cross multiply, I have 3t is equals to x minus 2. I'll make x subject. x becomes equal to um, 2 plus 3t. This is from, uh, from the first part, that one. When I do it for uh, the y term, now I'll take shortcuts. The y will remain alone. This y will remain alone. The 2 will multiply the t to give us 2t. The minus 5 will cross to become positive 5. In the same way, for this one here, the negative 1, so that's for z, z is equal to. So the negative 1 will multiply t to give us negative t. Then the negative one, this negative one here, will cross the equal sign to become positive, so it will become plus one. So the expression reduces to this. So these are the parametric equations for line one. Now we do the same thing for line two. For line two, I'll use the parameter u. So I'll do the slow version for, for the first one. So I'll say the parameter u is equal to x minus 4 over minus 4. The minus 4 will multiply the u to give us minus 4u is equals to x minus 4. The minus 4 will cross to become positive so that it will remain as x is equal to positive 4 when the 4 crosses, then minus 4u. That's the first one. Now take shortcuts with the rest. From the second one for y, we we'll have y is equal to the 4 we'll multiply the u to give us 4u positive. Then the minus 5 will cross to become positive. So it ends up looking like that. Then the last one for z, the 1 will multiply the u to give us plus u. And then the 2, it's positive. When it crosses, it becomes negative. So here we end up with minus 2. So I hope you guys were seeing the shortcuts I was taking and how I was getting them. They become quite helpful when you're trying to save time in a math exam. Not to say in a math exam, what kills most of us is time. You might know what to do. It's time and mistakes. When you try to be very fast, you end up making mistakes. So simple shortcuts that you can master very easily can help you save time so that you focus on some more tedious uh, uh, procedures. Okay, now we have L1 and L2 in Cartesian vector form. So how do we proceed here? So here now you have to equate. Since from here you have an expression for x, and from line 2 you also have an expression for x, at the point, at that one point where they intersect, regardless of where that point is, at that point where they intersect, the value of x must be the same as the value of x either end. Meaning that for that single point where they intersect, the 
2 plus 3t from line 1 must be the same as 4 minus 4u from line 2. So this must be true for that point which you, uh, you do not know. If they intersect, that point must, in, must exist. And from here, when we simplify um, all the variables with t on the left side, or all the variables on the left side, we get 3t. This becomes plus 4u. This becomes equal to 4 minus 2. So we have 3t plus 4u is equals to 2. We can take this as the first one. And then from uh, the values for the expressions for y, again, here we are assuming that, okay, let's assume they actually intersect. We know to say, even though they are not parallel, there are still two possibilities. Either they intersect at one point, or they are skew lines where they do not intersect. They're not parallel, uh, but uh, they still don't intersect. One lies on top of the other. That is still a possibility. But here we're first assuming that uh, maybe, maybe they intersect. If they intersect, then at that point where they intersect, this x must be the same as this. This y must be the same as that. This z must be the same as this at that point of intersection. That is the approach we are taking. But we are not yet saying that it's a fact this point actually exists. We'll check whether it exists uh, at the very end. You'll see. So from the expressions for y at the point of intersection, then 5 plus 2t must be the same as 5 plus 4u. And then when we group everything on the left side, we get 2t minus 4u. This has to be equals to 5 minus 5. Here, we now have 2t minus 4u is equals to 0. Or we can say 2t is equals to 4u. Or t is equals to 2u. This becomes number 3. Number 3 will come from the expressions for z. Notice that this is similar to what we did in the previous, in last night's examples. I hope you guys remember that one. From the expressions for z at the point of intersection, from line 1, 1 minus t has to be the same as from line 2, minus 2 plus u. For the variables on one side, I'll take t to the right. This becomes 1 plus 2 is equals to t becomes positive plus u. So now I can say t plus u will be equal to 3 as my equation 3. We now have three equations. And notice that the variables we have, it's only two variables. And to solve a simultaneous equation with two variables, you only need two equations, not three. But here we have three equations. It's like we won't even need the third one. But guess what? We will need the third one. Not to help us find anything, but to test if what we have done, to test if the points actually do intersect, to test if the lines, uh, this point of intersection actually does it. That will be the purpose of the third point, of the third equation. What are we doing here? We are trying to find the value of t and u, which ensures that these two lines intersect. So we can pick any two equations from here. We can pick one and two, we can pick two and three, we can pick three and one. So once I pick equation one and equation two, then I'll use equation three to test if that point actually does indeed exist. If the point in exists, then it must satisfy this equation. When I substitute the value of t in equation one, it, the left side must be the same as the right side. When I substitute the value of t and u in equation two, the left and the right must be the same. And when I substitute them in equation three, even though I'm not using it to find t and u, they must satisfy it as well. If they do satisfy equation 3 in the end, then, yes, the lines intersect and I can proceed to find the point of intersection. Let's check this one. First, we'll solve 1 and 2 to find the values of t and u which satisfy um, intersection. So since 
t is already subject in equation two. I'll just substitute it in equation one. In equation one, where there is t, I'll put two u. From here, I get six u plus four u is equals to two. Ten u is equals to two. U is equal to one over five. Since u is one over five, from equation two, I can now say t is equals to two multiplying one over five. So now I have t is equals to two over five. So I have found the values of t and u from equations one and two. But do the lines intersect? To see if these two points, these two values of t and u, allow the two lines to intersect, we'll test them using the third equation. Where there is t, I'll put 2 over 5. This is the test. Where there is t, this, I'm just going to get the left hand side. From the left hand side, where there is t, I'll put 2 over 5. Where there is u, I'll put 1 over 5. Now the question is, will this give me 3? Will this give me the right hand side? If it will give me the right hand side, then yes, the values of t and u allow for intersection, meaning I'll use either t or u in either here. If I'm using t, I'll put t everywhere here to get what x, y, and z is going to be. Or I'll use u here to get what x, y, and z is going to be. But you, you know, that regardless of whether you pick t and put it in line 1 to get x, y, and z, or get u, put it in line 2, you still get the same coordinates. But let's first test here. Will this give me 3? Here, common denominator, so just get that denominator, add the numerators. 2 and uh, 1, that gives us 3. We get 3 over 5. The left hand side has reduced to 3 over 5. Is this 3 over 5 the same as the right hand side? This is not equal to our right hand side. What is our conclusion here? Here, the two lines are not parallel, but the two lines do not intersect. So, what are we saying? The two lines are skew lines. So, they're not parallel, the two lines are different. The two lines do not intersect. The two lines are skew lines. Okay, so in our next example, we're going to look at uh, B now. And it's the same concept. We want to see or discuss the intersection of a pair of lines. Now we have line one and line two described as given there. So we're going to copy those two lines and uh, just write them down here. And these are the two lines. So this is going to be B. So first thing and foremost, first and foremost, what you're trying to do is first you're trying to answer one simple concept, one simple question. Are the lines parallel? That is your first question whenever it comes to these two intersection of lines. Are the lines parallel? So to answer if they are parallel, you look at their direction, their direction vector. You know to say the concept of direction comes from the coefficient of that parameter. You want to compare these. So here you have minus 5, minus 2, plus 4. If you're not sure of comparing them when they are symmetric or parametric, you can still get the vector equation first. It might be easier when you do it that way. So from line one, I have minus five, minus five i. Then I have minus two j. Then I have plus four k. From line two, I have three i. Then I have one j. Then I have here, I'm seeing three. Okay, so when I compare this and this, are they the same? They are not the same. I am looking for a question 
where there will, there will be a little bit of a relation between these two. I'll show you. That's a special case where they might not directly look the same, but they're actually the same direction. I'll show you, I think, after this example, I'll show you how that works. But for now, we're seeing just where it's plain simple, the two vectors are different. 5, 3, negative 5, 3, negative 2, 1, negative uh, positive 4, 3. These two vectors are different. Based on that, we conclude that the two lines are not parallel. So L1 and L2 are not parallel. If they're not parallel, that leaves us with two possibilities. Either they are skew lines, meaning they do not intersect, they are distinct completely, or they're distinct, but they intersect at exactly one point. Those are the two possibilities. So the approach we would take for this one will be similar to the previous example, where here the best thing is they are already expressed in terms of x, so we just equate. We equate from line one and line two, we equate since at the point of intersection, minus two minus five t must be the same as two plus three again. When we simplify this, I can say, uh, 5t goes to the right, we end up with 5t plus 3n. And then here this is going to be minus 2, minus 2. Basically, 5t, 3n, minus 4. And then from the expressions for y, we have from line 1, minus 3, minus 2t. And then from line 2, we have minus 1 plus n. I'm trying to skip the explanations here because this is similar to what we did in the previous example. So I'll take um, t to the to the right, negative 2t to the right, and then rearrange. So this is going to be positive 2t plus n. I hope you guys are seeing how I'm doing this rearrangement. It's like first I am taking 2t to negative 2t to the right, so this would be minus 3, then this would be plus 1 as the 1 jumps to come to the left. And then the 2t will be positive. But I'm jumping straight from here. I am rearranging so that I'm starting with this one. So it will be 2t plus n equal to, when I add here, this becomes minus 2. This becomes our equation 2. And then from uh, line one in terms of z, we have one plus 40. From line two in terms of z, we have three n. So this becomes 40 minus three n is equals to negative one. I've moved three n to the left, the one to the right. This becomes number three. Now comes the simultaneous equation. It's again similar to what we did in the previous example. So we use equation one and two to find what n and t, what they are. Then we use equation three to test if indeed the two lines will intersect. So in this case, let's try, we can pick anything here. I'll get equation two from equation two, I'll make, I'll make n subject. So in any subject, this is going to be minus two t minus two, because I'll take this to the right so that it also becomes negative. Then I'll substitute this where there's n in equation one. So this is now five t plus three multiplying negative two t minus two is equals to minus four. You guys must be checking what I'm doing to make sure that I don't make any, any slight or silly errors. So this would be five T. So the three multiplies negative two T becomes minus 60. Three multiplies negative two, that becomes minus six. This equals to minus four. These two will give us minus T. 
the 6 goes to the right becomes positive. So that now we have minus t is equals to positive 2. Or t is equals to minus 2. Now we go to the expression for n. We had n is equals to negative 2t minus 2. But t has come out as negative 2. This will be minus 2 multiplying minus 2. Then minus 2 there. So this will be plus 4 minus 2. n comes out as positive 2. We now have n, we also have t. Let's test if such a point actually exists. When it comes to this one, let's get the left hand side. On the left hand side, where there's t, we'll put minus 2. Where there's n, we'll put positive 2. Now the question is, will this expression give us negative 1? Let's check. When you multiply 4 in negative 2, we get minus 8. When you multiply minus 3 times 2, we get minus 6. In this case, this gives us minus 14. This is not the same as the right hand side. Based on this, the two lines are not intersecting. So here, the two lines L1, so how do we conclude this? Just like the previous example, L1 and L2 are not parallel. And they do not intersect. Therefore, they are skew lines. So we've just seen two examples where we've ended up with skew lines. So basically, this is how it goes. Now, there is one case, um, I, I thought we'd find at least where, or at least one, we've seen where they, where they intersect everywhere. We've seen uh, two examples where we had skew lines. I was hoping we'd see at least one where uh, they intersect at one point, but I hope the other ones there have that. But what I wanted to show you guys is, remember the vector that comes here? So I wanted to show you how this one goes. This one here where you have two lines here. Describe this way. First, let me check if that is described somewhere here. If there's an example that touches on that one, uh, I think I've gone too far. Okay, so let's see. Okay, it's not there. So this is four. This is one. And this is two nice line uh, e actually demonstrates uh, this concept i want to show you guys here e does a good job with that it's actually what this is based on is it the same here as well okay. so let me just describe it see if you have these two lines let me express these two lines in vector form In vector form, L1 will be x, y, z. And this will be equals to negative 2, negative 3, and 1. Plus t. And then the vector telling us direction, minus 5, minus 2, and 4. And then from line 2, we have x, y, z. Here we have 2, a point on the line, negative 1. And here we only have 3n, meaning the other coordinate must have been a 0 there. Plus, here the parameter is n. And then from here we have plus 3. 
then we have one then we have three here as well but i want to modify these equations a little bit so i'm gonna get rid of this modifying this so that i just use it for our example you see the term or the expression that is here remember it's a vector that is parallel to our line if in here this is a vector that is parallel to l2 now the magnitude of the of this vector can be something else all we're interested in is it must be parallel suppose this is the line i think we had a question like this in our previous class suppose this is a line that we are describing as l1 what you have to understand here is that to describe l1 we need one point of the line any point that point is what to take this position but it can be anything as long as the point is on the line next up we need a vector now the vector just it just has to be parallel to our line what does that mean it can be a vector like this one that goes that way but it can also be a vector like this one what do these two vectors have in common well they are parallel to l1 they have the same direction but what do they have what's the difference between them their magnitude if the length of the vector here represents how big the vector is you must understand that in this case the magnitude of this one will be smaller compared to the magnitude of this one it's like one vector r is let's say 4i let's say plus let's say 6j plus 10k this is one vector and then i have the second vector r2 given as let's say um, i can say 12i and then i'll say plus 18j then i'll say plus 30k you have to see that when i compare the two vectors the two vectors are different but the only difference is their magnitude their direction is still the same these two vectors are in the same direction the difference is that one vector is bigger than the other even if i was to try to sketch these vectors in three dimensions uh, can we see that sketch here so let's just change the page format uh, page template let's get a grid okay so if i was to try to plot these vectors here uh, let me not do it for this one not. let's just change this one back but let's do it here okay so if we were to try to make a sketch uh, this is a little bit off but hope it saves at least for someone so if we have something like this something like that and something like this what you have to understand here is that okay this is going to be weird because this is the grid is in two dimensions but we're going for a 4d a 3d i mean so when you're trying to plot this let's get the first one let's say 4 6 10 let's say 10 is uh the other one will go up to 30 so let me say 10 is uh, one box is 10. that would look a little bit weird let's go up to two boxes is 10. let's say 10 is here meaning uh 20 is here meaning 30 is here okay so if we have that uh, let's say that is 4 6 10 so let's say 4 is here let's say 6 is here now from here uh, 
up to um, this don't go like that. It's two boxes down. Let's say this is where that point is. Okay, that makes a bit of sense. Okay. Let's say this is where that uh, such that the vector we're going for, this one R1 that goes up to that point. That would be this vector coming from the origin up to here. Notice that if this is R1, when it comes to R2, what do we have for R2? For R2, it's like it's the same as R1, but it's just scaled up by a factor. What factor do we see? We observe that it's like to move from here to here, we are multiplying by a factor of what? A factor of 3. If we factored out 3 from R2, notice that this would be 3 here. What will remain is going to be from here, you have 4i. From here, you have 6j. From here, you will have 10k. What does this mean? It's just the magnitude of R2 uh, which has changed. It's bigger by a factor of 3. What does that mean in terms of visualization? If R1 was from here up to here, R3 will be in the same direction, but it will just be three times bigger compared to the first one. That will be the difference. So it will just be three times bigger, but the direction will still be the same. So the point here is that, so what I was talking about that is that two lines can be parallel to each other even though their vectors might not exactly be the same, as long as we can see that what makes the vectors different, it's just the direction. Otherwise, not the direction, it's just the magnitude. One has been scaled up. We can still argue to say that those two vectors are parallel to each other, or the lines are parallel to each other. In the other examples we're looking at, the vectors were just so different. When you look at this one, this vector, you cannot say that it has been scaled. There's, there's a common factor that can be factored out so that it becomes similar to this one. We can't see that. So based on that, these were just plain sight different. Same thing for our other examples that we've done. But when you look at the third, the fourth one here, E, you see that the vector from L2, I'll just get the vector here. From L2, the vector is 2i plus j. And that's not L2. Uh, I want this one here. This is E. From line one, we see that the vector is 20i minus 5j plus 10k. That's from line one. From line two, what is the vector? The vector will come from this, this, and this. We see that here the vector will be minus 4i. Then we have plus 1j, then we have minus 2t. Are these two vectors the same? Is the direction here the same? We see that just plain uh, inspection, it looks like they are different. But when you look closer, this is the same as this, but just scaled up by a certain factor. What factor? Notice that here, when you factor out a 5 from this vector, you're going to have 5 coming out. This will be 4i. Um, do I have a minus? I have a minus in play here. This is minus there. The other one is, oh yeah, we can factor out a minus 4. We can still factor out a minus 4. Minus 5, I mean. When you factor out minus 5, this will remain minus 4 here. And then this will remain, next one will become what? minus 4i, this will become plus j, then this will become minus. When 5 is coming out, this will remain 2k. We quickly see that by just factoring out minus 5, now this vector is the same as the other one. So it's like one vector has just been scaled up by a certain factor. Of course, the minus here just means that one vector is pointing this way, the other vector is pointing downwards that way. But still, all we are looking for is parallel, not necessarily going this way or direction and so on. The condition is that it's a vector parallel to our line.
So in this case, these two lines will be seen to be parallel to each other based on this logic. I hope you have got uh, that concept there. So I'll ask you guys to try out these two. I've already pointed out uh, uh, E there to say that the two lines will end up being parallel to each other. So the only question that you have to answer is, do they intersect everywhere or they do not intersect at all? And then next up, you have to do D as well. So there's also C there. So you have to check out C and see if uh, uh, what is happening there. But basically, it's the same approach as before. And yeah, if you get it, it's the same, it's the same concept. So let me know what you find. Uh, you can interact in the group, show me your solutions, and then I'll be able to verify them. If you have any trouble, feel free to reach out.